You are listening to Something Rather Than Nothing. Creator and host, Ken Vellante. Editor and producer, Peter Bauer. Hello, this is Ken Vellante. We are on the Something Rather Than Nothing podcast, and uh, I, I'm really pleased to welcome Jeff Oster, um, historian and uh, a writer who's uh, has written a book that I've, I've just read, uh, The Lakotas in the Black Hills. Um, he's explored, you know, questions of the American West, um, the, uh, of, of the United States and, and its history, and particularly the westward expansion and impacts in, in culture around uh, indigenous uh, nations um, that had, you know, existed, uh, you know, through the process and into the 19th, 20th, and 21st uh, century. I really appreciated the book, Jeff, and I really appreciate you coming on to the show to, to share some of your process and thinking and about uh, these historical issues. Uh, so welcome to the show, Jeff. Yeah, thank you very much, Ken. I really appreciate the invitation. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. And uh, um in, in getting in getting into it, um, and we'll we'll be talking about kind of general issues of how do, how do you write history, how do you create these things, how do you do what you do uh, professionally, but also talk about the content of um, your your historical work, uh, particularly on the Lakota Sioux. Big conceptual question to begin with, though, Jeff is I ask a lot of artists, writers, creators, painters, everyone. Uh, a general question at the beginning, and uh, the question is this: Were you a creator, artist, create things w- when you were born? Uh, I thought about that question, and you know, uh, I think uh, in my early years, uh, I was mainly an imitator. I think, uh, and I guess there's a certain creativity in imitating. Uh, but, you know, there were things in my environment that I would be exposed to that I would, you know, just try to imitate what other people were doing and what they were good at. Now, as I got a little bit older, uh, I think I became more creative in uh, a sense, uh, an ordinary sense that we would be talking about. And I kind of dabbled. I suppose a lot of young people do uh, dabble uh, and some quite seriously uh, with poetry and writing short stories uh, and things of that sort in my late teens uh, and early 20s. Uh, but uh, I wasn't very good at it, actually, uh, and uh, went on to other things. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think uh, just to start in the, the discussion initially, one of the things I think I, I've studied history, you know, uh, you know, uh, on my own as, as, as a personal interest. And uh, one of the one of the pieces I found really uh, interesting, some comments, uh, you know, that that I heard, uh, you know, from you is, is kind of writing uh, for different for different audiences. I've been around, uh, you know, I've studied philosophy at the university and I know, you know, the 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 important the deep dialogue that exists at the university. But it can be a dialogue that kind of feels separate from you know, somebody in a bookstore in Salem, Oregon, picking up a book and say, you know, what is this? And is it, is it accessible to me? So I know in getting into the Lakotas and the Black Hills, um, uh, published by, by Penguin, you have a massive amount of, of history, a contentious, uh, issue, and you're trying to speak generally to, you know, somebody who's going to pick that up about, about these issues. What was that process? What was that process like? And did it feel just substantively different from, you know, trying to maybe popularize or convey the history to a general audience in in, in that type of book? What was your experience? Right. It was a uh, learning experience to write the Lakotas and the Black Hills. And it, it had some challenges for me, I'll admit. Uh, I, you know, was trained uh, in a PhD program at the University of Iowa. Uh, I wrote a rather conventional dissertation about political history. Uh, I had believed uh, as a graduate student and was taught that one of the objectives was to write clearly. And that 
uh, you know, is I think a very valuable uh, kind of uh, baseline for writing history. Uh, but it's not always uh, a priority for academic writing. There's some uh, areas in academic writing where I think there's a kind of value placed on a kind of intentional obscurity uh, simply for the sake of it. Uh, and uh, I never really liked that, and I wasn't trained in that way. So I was trained, I think, to write clearly, uh, but still in a rather academic way and for other academics. Uh, and I had written uh, on political history, and then I had gotten interested in the history of the Lakota people, and particularly their relationship with the United States. And I had written, you know, again, another academic book for an academic press uh, called uh, The Plain Sioux and U.S. Colonialism from Lewis and Clark to Wounded Knee. And so I had learned quite a bit about Lakota history and Lakota people doing that book, but it was very academic work, uh, I hope clear, uh, but not for a general audience. So I was approached, uh, you know, by uh, uh, someone who was uh, coordinating with Viking uh, to write a series of books uh, for a general audience about North American indigenous history. And so there was to be a series. It turned out there were maybe eight or 10 books in this series. And I was approached to do that. Uh, but the idea was uh, to write in a different way than I had done, still to be academic, still to be clear, but somehow to write in a way that engaged a general audience more than I had done. So as I say, that was a challenge for me. Uh, and I was fortunate to have a good editor at Viking. Uh, he uh, knew nothing about the subject. Uh, and when I first uh, submitted a manuscript to him, he read it and got back to me and was fairly critical. You know, he said, for example, you know, you're writing about some famous Native Americans that uh, the general public will know about. You're writing about Sitting Bull. Everybody's heard of Sitting Bull. You're writing about Crazy Horse. Everybody's heard of Crazy Horse. And you're writing about a landscape. And he said, you know, I uh, went online and looked at some of the places that you're writing about in the Black Hills and around, like Devil's Tower is what the American's name for it is. And it's kind of an offshoot of the Black Hills in northeastern Wyoming. Uh, and, you know, people have been there. It's a national monument. He, he said, I looked it up. I'd never been there. And uh, these are incredible places. Yeah. And you need to describe these people. You need to say something about <laughs> them, their lives, who they were. Yeah. And you need to describe these places. Give the reader a sense of I'm here. Or yeah. give the reader a sense of this is how Lakota people uh, felt and understood and lived in this incredible land. And so that was a challenge to me. And, uh, you know, I tried to do it. It was hard. I uh, have never been very good about writing about actual human beings. I'm much better at writing about things like the policies that human beings create or the political wars that they fight, but actual human beings, not so much. So I had to uh, really figure out ways uh, to try to do that and then to write about the land. So I don't know how successful that was, but I worked on that. And as I say, I had a good editor, so I would resubmit after a few months of what was, for me was difficult work. And uh, then he would say, well, this is better, but, and then he would go after me on something else. And uh, we went back and forth a few times. And uh, it is a process when you're working with an editor like that. Of course, you respect the person's views and you respect the time that that person is taking to work with you so closely. But your immediate reaction, or at least my immediate reaction, is to be irritated and annoyed. You know, I wrote this, I think it's great, and you're telling me that it has problems and it still needs work? 
Well, it's a very common response, I think. Uh, but that is uh, my initial response. But then after a day or two, of course, I would realize that he was right and try to go back to it. So uh, I can't remember how many drafts I wrote and rewrote, but it was three or four probably. And, uh, it, you know, it was working with that editor that uh, really uh, helped me learn uh, what uh, new things I had to do uh, to write that book. Yeah, and 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 and, and thank you. I, I found it to be. Uh, uh, I got a sense like uh, of of the task at hand, and I think you lay that out at the beginning. Um, and I found it to be just really helpful uh, for for my understanding. And also, it's a strange word to use, but even about the what's going on at the time and trying to um, talk about the general dynamics and to create some awareness of understanding of the Lakota Sioux before and after, you know, the historical events that we know about. And that's what I wanted to, to ask. I know it's a, a little bit of a difficult uh, uh, question, but um, as I've learned about different uh, uh, indigenous nations um, in, 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 really was surprised at the scope of the Lakota Sioux Nation and the prominence uh, of it uh, to this day and, and, and before. But can you set up, can you set up generally um, the, 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 the dynamic for, um, you know, U United States, whether it be colonialism or encroachment into these uh, lands and uh, the Lakota uh, being in the Black Hills, um, what what's going on? Uh, what's going on uh, in the conflict um, that many people would know, uh, Wounded Knee, and in that history there. When you're doing Lakota in the Black Hills, what's 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 going on um, in, in that historical situation? Uh, just just generally for the listeners, yeah. Well, there's always, whenever you're dealing with indigenous histories and indigenous nations in relationship to the United States, you know, there's always specific things about any one of these histories, right? So that, you know, uh, you're in Albany, Oregon, I'm in Eugene, Oregon, and we're uh, on Kalapuya territory. And uh, there's some specific things about Kalapuya people, and there's specific things about the uh, settlement of Oregon or the invasion of Oregon, if you want to put it that way, and how uh, the lands of indigenous people where we are are converted uh, into the state of Oregon and into uh, a system of uh, private property and capitalism that, that we live under. And, you know, was emerging uh, in, in uh, the 1850s when this happened. So there's specific things that occur that we have to talk about. The details will vary. Uh, and this is true of the Lakotas as well. I mean, the Lakotas, uh, by the time the United States really wanted to take over their land uh, in the mid and late 19th century, um, you know, the Lakotas were a very powerful uh, nation. They controlled a lot of territory, and they also controlled this incredible, and it was the sort of center of their world, uh, both geographically, but also uh, cosmologically, uh, of the Black Hills. And, uh, you know, I subtitled my book, The Struggle for Sacred Land. I mean, this was sacred land. All indigenous land is sacred land. But it's in this very specific ways that I tried to explain uh, the importance of the Black Hills to, to the Lakota Nation. Uh, so there's those specifics. Uh, that having been said, though, there is, I think, a very general uh, pattern here. Uh, it's not my story is in some ways Lakota specific, but it also illustrates a very general pattern about relations between the United States and indigenous people. And in the end, I think it boils down to land. I mean, I think that from the beginning of the United States, and really, if you go to 1776, and why did we have a revolution in the first place? 
Why did the colonies want to get out from under the thumb of King George and the British Empire was that, you know, the British Empire was placing restrictions on colonists being able to settle and speculate in Western lands. And a lot of the leading revolutionaries, George Washington would be a very excellent case in point, speculated heavily in Western lands. And they were mad at uh, the British Empire for restricting uh, their ability to secure uh, title to those lands. So, you know, it's all about land from the very beginning. Uh, and, you know, the United States, for various reasons, wants native lands. And uh, as, you know, uh, the United States expands west, as its empire develops uh, in the west, we have story after story after story of, I think it's a story of theft. You know, it, the United States wants to make it look like it's uh, occurring with voluntary agreements with Native nations ceding their lands, but I don't think that's really what's happening when you actually bore down in the details. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's theft, ultimately. And when we come to the Lakotas, uh, many nations have already been dispossessed. Uh, and, you know, then there's a specific story about how the United States dispossesses Lakotas of most of their lands. And I think, again, it's a story of theft. It has its particular details, uh, you know, which I tried to work out and tell uh, in the book. Yeah, yeah. I um, I had uh, uh, one, one of the, the, the pieces, I think, you know, for popular thinking or something that I've thought about is, you know, Mount, Mount Rushmore. And, um, yeah. you know, I would have been, you know, I when when I, when I went through, you know, public school, the one I heard, I had uh, two days of indigenous history, you know, probably 1980s in Rhode Island. And um, I learned about the, the Nez Perce and I learned about Chief Joseph. Well, Chief Joseph immediately was my hero. I was so deeply like enthralled with those stories. And after a couple of days, that was, that was, you know, the, the end of my education. I think there's a lot of popular notions. If you take a look at like Mount Rushmore, right. It's a, you know, monument. Uh, I, as I got into that, I, I could not, I, I could not understand, um, that 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 what was done and where it was placed and the images that were used there was such an overt it felt it feels to me like such an overt corruption or uh, it, this isn't your place this is who stands here these are your leaders and and it stands to me as a a, a deep scar um uh, just for me looking at it and i i i struggle with kind of how we generally view our, you know, monuments and, and this and that. And it's told as a story of perseverance and cutting into the mountain and Mount Rushmore. Uh, this stands like right, 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 right there. What are the, there's such controversy uh, around this. And was that there just as a, as a primary offense or symbol to the peoples or is just a kind of a, a general manifestation of colonialism, ignorance, or what have you? Do you know what I'm asking? Well one way to one way to approach the question, Ken, I think might be just to uh, you know, when I I had been to Mount Rushmore before I had really become interested in Native American history. Uh, and visited, uh, you know, I was aware of some of the history that I later learned much more about, but I wasn't working in that area. When I started working uh, in this area, then, of course, I went back to Mount Rushmore a few times. And, um, you know, and also Devil's Tower, uh, which is... Uh, kind of part of the Black Hills too, you know, and also a sacred place uh, to Lakotas and many other nations. And um, I would see 
a few native people at these sites, like in the parking lot. I remember in the parking lot of Devil's Tower seeing, I'm pretty sure Lakotas, they were Native American, a couple. And, you know, they were just weeping. And I knew that it was because of how they understood these sites as um, not only that this was their homelands that had been taken, that they no longer had them, and that they were being overrun by a bunch of tourists and mountain climbers who really didn't care anything about them. And the whole history of what and the and what they're living through, and who knows what this particular couple might have been living through. But you know, I know enough about current Lakota life and so on. Uh, so um, it's not just that, though. It's also what I think you're getting at with Mount Rushmore in particular is that, you know, um, it, it's really just a symbol, in-your-face symbol to Lakota and other indigenous people of um, a kind of arrogance, an imperial arrogance of white supremacy, right? And, um, you know, it, it's been described, I mean, uh, one Lakota described it as if it was a cal the boot of a cavalryman stomping, right? You know, that older history, and there it is still, right? And so um, uh, those, are, those are some of the resonances that I think I've picked up you know, Lakota people don't like to go to Mount Rushmore, really. Now, they did, of course, when Trump went there back in, uh, uh, you know, summer of um, 2020 on July 4th and, uh, you know, gave a big speech and so on. And the South Dakota governor really likes it, you know. Uh, and, of course, you may remember and your listeners may remember that uh, there were a number of Lakota people who protested Trump's visit and uh, for a period of time blocked uh, one of the access roads uh, for traffic. And uh, many of them uh, were arrested and some on felony charges, which have uh, been dropped. And, you know, they uh, I was watching that protest in real time. And, you know, they were saying we want this is stolen land. We want this land back. Right. And this was part of uh, this growing uh, movement uh, among indigenous people generally. Uh, you know, there's a hashtag for it, hashtag land back. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. I. Um, it was one of those, I think, as far as going into um, uh, indigenous, indigenous, you know, history and, and where I, I think any academic or thinker just really kind of dislikes kind of like lazy thinking or accepting the narrative. And it usually takes a radical juncture or being introduced information being that's not really what this thing is, or at least uh, it interrogating a force in that uh, to, to think about that. Like if that happened to you and um, so it's, it, it, it changes, it changes the thinking. And of course, you know, as you mentioned, connected to sacred lands, it wasn't just, a monument on the side of the highway that's offensive and displays the wrong person. It's a wholesale, this is where it is. Here's the mark and, and deal with it. I wanted to ask you, and, and I know this, this, this topic is, um, is, uh, is, is very large, but uh, one of the things that uh, I find around the language in, 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 in speaking about indigenous issues is uh, one of which you raised in your book about a uh, genocide and how there's a complicated, there's kind of like a complicated history and that uh, definition that comes out, you know, um, from, from the UN and historians and others dealing with the meaning of, of genocide. And one of the, one of the dynamics that I've noticed in, 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 and tell me maybe if you see it this way is that, I've been introduced by you and in, in listening to some uh, in, in delving into more about what genocide is and what the intent is. But at the same time, I think when you hear the word 
genocide and common speech, we think eradication, they're gone. We are here. Let's tell you what happened. Where the dynamic is one of facing g- genocide, dispossession, but also surviving as a culture and having resilience as a, as a culture. And the fact is, when we talk about Lakota Sioux right now, we're on, not talking about wounded knee. We're talking about a vibrant, existing, and fighting culture uh, for for their lands. So my main uh, my main question is is for you as you talk about both genocide and, uh, and, and, and resilience, is that a dynamic that you're moving back and in, in, in forth between? Cause I think when people hear genocide, they're like, Oh, let's hear the history about a, a gone people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this, uh, your question I think is very important and matters a lot to a lot of current discussions. And, um, you know, there are, uh, there are, concerns among uh, many indigenous scholars that I know and have talked with and have read about um, writing a history of genocide um, for the very reason that you say, because particularly indigenous people in North America uh, are extremely vulnerable to a myth a widespread public notion that they have disappeared uh, and uh, or a very little consequence and um, and then, you know, can be available as mascots or something like that. But otherwise, they're not real people and that they are people, uh, you know, the only real Indians uh, are uh, those in war bonnets and on horses uh, in on the plains in the late 19th century, and that they're gone, and you know, and and that if we talk about genocide, uh, indigenous scholars and and activists uh, and ordinary people worry sometimes that it will reinforce those precise notions. And I think uh, there's a real sense of uh, that because there's such a long mythology about Indians disappearing and having disappeared, uh, that we have to be extremely cautious. Uh, So uh, should we talk about genocide at all? Uh, And I think we have to, because I do think it's a fact. Uh, But how do we do it? Uh, And I think that it's a challenge. Uh, I've uh, written about this in various uh, venues and um, always find it a challenge to both balance uh, the fact of genocide uh, with the fact of um, uh, a term that a lot of scholars use is survivance rather than survival as a kind of way of conveying a sort of active uh, resistance and uh, instead of just a kind of passive survival. Resilience is another key word. Uh, and so both of those things need to be uh, in play together. Now, I should also say that although one thinks of genocide generally as meaning the extinction of a people, uh, all, there's always survivors of genocide, you know. I, I mean, um, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of Jewish people, uh, and, you know, the Holocaust being the sort of paradigmatic genocide, um, and as horrific as uh, the Holocaust was, uh, you know, of course, there were survivors, both kind of within the core of what was happening, but also um, elsewhere around the world. And so um, these things always are uh, going to need to be operating together, a sense of both genocide, but also of survival, survival. And, you know, the afterlife, of genocides uh, and and how we think about, okay, uh, you know, uh, a particular genocide in Rwanda is over or a particular genocide in Guatemala is over, but it lives on, you know, in various ways through trauma, through memory, uh, through uh, trying to write the histories in various ways, through reconciliation, through... um, uh, 
you know, what, what's uh, the term I'm looking at, reparations in, in some cases as well. And, you know, we see that uh, uh, quite dramatically lately in terms of the Canadian residential schools, you know. Uh, there's been such a public discourse about the finding of uh, these graves that every all the survivors of those residential schools knew they were there. And they actually told people about them and they'd say, well, I don't know. And now they're finding the evidence, you know, and, and, you know, it's very traumatic, I think, for people uh, who are descendants of, and, and survivors, but it, it goes on and it needs, you know, people want a reckoning about it. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I will, I will say, um, it, I, in listen to your comments or, it's helped with a more sophisticated and useful idea of genocide and in, in continuing in continuing on about uh, the impacts uh, of within culture. And, you know, um, I think my thinking was also informed that I recently read a, a very long book by Ann Applebaum about the Ukraine, about Ukraine and uh, the Holomador. Yeah. And, um, uh, famine. And I yeah. was startled um, after hearing everything that had happened about the nuances of the discussion around is this, a, you know, is this a genocide? And I think those are useful. Those are very useful discussions um, and far more sophisticated than I thought. And I think my my natural like so I'm an activist in. I, you know, I work in labor. So sometimes I'll get, I look to here and say, what is it? Is it this? Okay. Since it's that we go ahead there. But I think the considerations are really important because they show a dynamic of genocide rather than this just blunt fact that we move on from that. It has these complicating uh, factors. So I, I appreciate the, the work that you've done. And also, like I said, reading about um, other significant uh, issues, of course, with the Ukraine and famine and God, the goodness, like just what you said, that's going on right now, right? All we're doing, yeah. many people are looking at the Ukraine and that history of starvation and being used as yeah. the, uh, yeah. you know, the food basket for Russia is, uh, well, it's it's today as well. Um, Jeff, I wanted to ask you a, a question uh, of, <laughs> of particular interest around um the process and the creativity and the thinking that you have, because you're a professor, okay? So you've done this research, you have a lot of training, you've changed uh, and, and, and developed as an historian, but now you're in front of a classroom and you got the, you know, uh, minds who are interested and signed up uh, for your course. And I know when I've taught, I've always been super excited about the, maybe the power to talk about things or to engage and to direct. What about the creative aspects as you are working with students and saying, okay, I did this. I read this, you read this book and you read these histories. What about the creative interactive process uh, for you as a lecturer, professor to convey what has happened in our history? Yeah. Well, some of the work I do in classrooms is pretty conventional uh, teaching of history, which one wouldn't ordinarily think of as particularly, you know, on the creative side of things or on, you know, uh, as, as art. Uh, so students need to learn to analyze documents, you know and to read them well and to think about them correctly. That's kind of basic work. That said, there are things that I've done uh, in classrooms that I think do involve uh, a little bit more of what we think of as uh, creativity in, in uh, a kind of sense of art. Uh, and I think one of the things that has happened in uh, with the technology of teaching is uh, just that you can do quite a bit more with visuals than you used to be able to. So when I'm teaching to uh, a group of 150 or 200 students, uh, you know, I'm using much more than I used to high quality visual material that is pretty easy uh, to get and uh, to show. 
And so then you're thinking a little bit maybe more about how can I use visual material to move to uh, move students, you know, uh, to, because uh, uh, a painting uh, of Wounded Knee, uh, the Wounded Knee Massacre of 1890, which I write about in the book, uh, you know, you can ask students to analyze those documents. And of course, uh, you know, we have accounts by Lakota survivors, and that can be uh, moving. And you can ask them to analyze those, and that is important work to do. Uh, but if you then show them uh, a 1950s painting by um, a uh, Dakota painter named Oscar Howe, who was uh, a quite brilliant painter, and is known some, but should be better known. He's on par with uh, the great painters of the world, there's no doubt. Uh, he has a, a very compelling painting of the Wounded Knee Massacre. And uh, he, of course, was born after it. Uh, and he did not know about it firsthand. He knew about it partly from reading about it and partly from hearing about it. But, you know, he has an interpretation of it. Um, I think it's as strong a work as Picasso's Guernica, you know, uh, which I've seen as well. And uh, of course, that that painting moves people. I mean, it, yeah. it's so powerful. And so you can show students that. So in a way, then there's a creativity that I've tried to do of bringing art like that into the classroom. And you can get students to talk about that. Uh and other, you know, uh, imagery of that, uh, uh, of that sort as well. Um, I also like to, uh, I like to use novels uh, in my teaching. Uh, I've often felt that um, having students read novels, his, you know, that are historically situated, uh, novelists can do things that historians really can't do in the way of getting you to feel and know certain things or, and have certain kinds of empathies maybe um, that, you know, um, historians generally can't quite do. So um, I've lately been uh, teaching uh, a uh, novel by Louise Erdrich, uh, the uh, Ojibwe novelist who finally recently won uh, the Pulitzer Prize. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which I think was overdue. Uh, but, uh, you know, and she's your listeners, many of them, most of them will know of her and know of her work. Uh, but the novel of hers that I've been teaching is uh, The Roundhouse, which is maybe six, seven years old. And um, it really uh, centers on uh, the issue of uh, rape of indigenous women, which uh, you know, is is uh, very serious and uh, uh, un, not well enough understood and certainly poorly addressed uh, major problem. And um, so it's, uh, you know, a historically uh, based novel, uh, but it gets you, uh, gets student to be able to think about this issue because they can see through that novel the impact uh, of uh, the rape of a woman on herself, but also on her family and her community and can think through uh, the issues of why uh, we have such a hard time uh, addressing uh, matters of justice uh, yeah. in cases of this crime. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, for for your answer and kind of taking us in about the the art the visual representations and in in novels I'm I'm a lover of novels myself and you know connecting that to the history of the I think in a more of a building empathy right it needs to be a good novel and these you know those things need to be there but building empathy or the the internal workings of the mind that you might be able to convey yeah. Uh, yeah. by by a novel um. I had a I had a question I'm really interested in your thoughts about um and it's about writing history um and I I've I viewed like you know if you go to a bookstore or in a library and you see a topic 
uh, just a regular person, right? And it's like, here's a history. It's in the history section, the history book here. And then they read it. And there's, a, I think, a natural you know, deference to the historian who studied this and, like, knows stuff about it. And, you know, is there, in, in writing history, more responsibility than than in other types of 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 writing i i think there can be i haven't written a history book but is there more responsibility because what you're trying to do is convey the narrative of what occurred and there's some yeah. deference on part of the audience to yeah. take what you said occurred i think that's a very interesting question and uh i'm not sure i'm going to get the answer right on this um uh, in some ways, yes, maybe, because I think there is an obligation in the discipline of history uh, to be accurate. And uh, uh, we, you know, we become very sophisticated about thinking about writing history. Nobody really thinks that it's possible to write a totally objective, totally accurate history because, you know, we know that we all have subject positions. Uh, we all know that historical interpretations are affected by, you know, um, the political environment and so on by, you know, who we are. Uh, and uh, we know that uh, writing history is a form of, of, of storytelling. It's a form of narrative. And we know that um, whether we're conscious of it or not, that histories tend to be implauded. Uh, and so, you know, we, some people write a tragic history, some people write a happy history, some people write an ironic history, and so on. And so we're more sophisticated about thinking about that. Um, but I do think that because there is uh, an obligation, at least most historians, I think, feel this in one way or another, uh, to be accurate. They may be uncomfortable with saying, I'm going to tell the truth. But I think there's some obligation to that. And um, that may not be as operative in other areas. Uh, and so one could argue that there's a kind of specific responsibility there. On the other hand, though, I would say that um, other areas have this same kind of responsibility in a certain way. So... Uh, just jumping to mind, um, you know, one thinks of historians as interested in facts. One doesn't really think of painters as interested in facts. But uh, one of the painters that I've uh, found most compelling uh, is, uh, you know, the British painter Francis Bacon. Uh, and, you know, uh, he... Uh, to describe his own work, I believe it's his own self-description, talked about the brutality of fact. And, you know, his figures are trying to get at some fact that is kind of beneath the surface in a certain way um, about the human body and about human beings, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's uh, maybe not necessarily a responsibility on his part as, as an artist that all artists would take up, but he certainly did. Uh, and wanted uh, to reveal a certain truth. And certainly artists do that, right? So they have a responsibility to truth. They may think of it in different ways as to how uh, they are revealing uh, certain aesthetic truths, certain philosophical truths, uh, and so on. So there would be a responsibility there. Now, if we also are thinking about this in terms of um, indigenous uh, cultures, histories, representations, and so on, then I think, you know, so I'm obviously a non-native scholar. Uh, and so I come at uh, this as an outsider. So I have certain responsibilities there, I think. And uh, some of this uh, is, I think, a responsibility uh, to write in a way that does not damage uh, or harm uh, the people I'm writing about. And uh, that is a kind of ethical responsibility uh, in this field, I believe. Uh, that would mean, for example, that I may not want to write about certain things 
uh, that uh, a given community might regard as private or sacred or none of my business. Uh, it would also mean that I would need to establish relationships uh, with the people themselves, you know. And, you know, I tried to do that. Uh, maybe I didn't do enough of that, but I certainly uh, did establish uh, relationships with, with, with Lakota people as I was uh, doing my work. And the way that that worked for me was kind of just talking to them and, and about ideas I had and checking things out and having them share with me information, uh, both, you know, oral histories, but also just documents, you know, because, uh, you know, Lakota people understand they can know history through documents as well as oral histories. Uh, so I think there's a responsibility there uh, for a historian or for an anthropologist or for whoever, an academic. But I also think that uh, anybody who is working with indigenous communities would have to have this same kind of responsibility. So if you were doing a documentary or something, uh, I, I think, and going into a community, you would need to do this. If you were uh, writing a novel uh, that hadn't, uh, that featured indigenous characters or an indigenous community. I think you wouldn't want to just make stuff up. Uh, I, I think you there is a responsibility on the part of a novelist as an artist uh, to have some sense of um, trying to do this ethically in the same way that a historian would have. Uh, it would obviously work out in different ways, but I think that same responsibility I would think needs to be there. Others might disagree on that. Yeah. Well, and thank you. Thank you for uh, thinking about that. And, and yeah, uh, you know, expanding it out to say, <coughs> you know, as, as, and the question of uh, creation, I, when I ask this question in general, I've asked it uh, different forms of it uh, time to time. One way I've asked about responsibility has been with artists and being like, you got a gift, What's your responsibility towards it? And I find it such an interesting area to engage because you have individual, you have everybody's individual autonomy and you have folks from the outside being like, you can do this and you must do it. Or as an artist or a creator or a writer, you're around people who show a propensity towards that. You got to go in there and help, help them with that too. So it's a, it's always a fascinating area because I think in general, you know, uh, there might be that there, but who's, you know, who is it? And I think you're pointing that uh, care and attention and kind of ethical discourse and knowledge is kind of the focus for anybody who's going to speak about. Yeah. About, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, folks, we're speaking with uh, Jeff Osler, uh, professor of history, uh, University of Oregon. Um, and uh I just I've just really enjoyed talking with you uh, with with you, Jeff, and uh, and about some some really fascinating areas about, you know, your work and about the Lakota Sioux people and, and about politics. There's some really there's some really um, big topics here, um, you know, that we that we obviously um, get into. But one of the things I wanted to say um uh, to, to, to listeners is that uh, at least my personal view is that I've seen, uh, scholarship and, uh, academic activity and also popular TV shows, cultural shows created by indigenous folks, whether it be independent media, whether it be something that's on NBC, uh, Rutherford Falls, whether it's, uh, reservation dogs on, on, on FX. One of the questions I've asked Jeff is that I've seen, uh, uh, maybe more awareness, more political awareness around missing and murdered indigenous peoples about the Lakota Sioux, about uh, fiction or true narratives around uh, in, indigenous life. Do you think, uh, whether it's within history and popular culture, that we're in a different spot now here in 2022 with how we engage around U.S. history and indigenous peoples? I do somehow. I'm not quite sure. You know, one of the things I'm aware of as a historian is that um, people historically have never had a very good sense of what was really happening at the time. Uh, and, you know, we, looking back, 
from 200 years understand much better what was happening in some ways than the people at the time, you know, because we're in it. We don't know quite where we are and where we're going. Um, but I sense something different um, in the last few years. And um, I think it, uh, I would mark uh, the Standing Rock water protectors uh, trying to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline in 2015-16 as kind of the point where I see, and I don't think that triggered everything, but I think it's really a point of reference. And I'll bet historians in 20 or 50 years are going to look back on that as an, as, as an important event, like we look back on uh, some of the protests of the 1960s in um, you know, uh, with the American Indian movement, but also with uh, civil rights and black power and so on. So, um, but I also think culturally, and these things are always related, you know, I think you mentioned Rutherford Falls, uh, I think is a sign of something, uh, you know, a really indigenous produced with indigenous um, actors uh, and modern and funny in, in, in its way. Uh, and I haven't seen Reservation Dogs, but I've heard very good things about it, kind of in the same way, uh, and need, need to look at it. Um, and also just take, for example, uh, you know, to some extent, this comes out of Black Lives Matter, but very quickly, uh, you know, in the summer of 2020, you know, we saw uh, also the turn to uh, people protesting this had been going on, you know, with, say, Father Sarah in California uh, and so on. But, you know, we saw, um, you know, in Minneapolis or in St. Paul, not at all far, uh, you know, uh, from um, where George Floyd had been murdered. You know, we saw Columbus go down uh, and, you know, other similar things like that. And. You know, and then uh, we did see the Washington football team's racist name renamed. And, you know, there had been a lot of resistance to doing that for a wow. long, long time. So that happened. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, that didn't really mean anything. It's very symbolic. So what? Uh, you know, but I think something like that shows us that something is changing. Now, I think we're also seeing a lot of backlash to that. Right. Uh, most of it's centering around, you know, uh, this uh, backlash to uh, critical race theory, uh, you know, that's been demagogued by the right uh, and, you know, resistance to changes in the curriculum and things like that. Fortunately, we don't see much of that in Oregon uh, gaining much traction, uh, but it is afoot uh, around the country. So I do think something has changed in the last few years and there's more awareness and engagement with uh, on the part of non-native people i see it in my classrooms you know uh, non-native students are more interested than they've ever been and they also feel that it's that there are important things that they can learn and need to learn from indigenous people and communities and histories and I think climate change matters in, in that connection, particularly, because I think a lot of people are saying, you know, the continent was actually in pretty damn good shape for like tens of thousands of years. Right. Yeah. And now it's not. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's extinction, it's climate change. And so what uh, can we learn from indigenous knowledge? Yeah. Uh, along these lines. Uh, students at University of Oregon are reading Robin Kemmerer's uh, book, Braiding Sweetgrass, this year. You know, she's a Potawatomi scientist, uh, and uh, I believe her formal scientific training is a botanist, but she really wants to bring in indigenous knowledge into thinking about ecologies, you know. And I think, you know, in those kinds of areas, environmental studies and so on, people are much more focused uh, on indigenous knowledge uh, than they were. 
Yeah. And, 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 and thank you for bringing in those, uh, you know, different components to consider as part of that. Um, and, you know, when we look at land stewardship, um, ideas of land stewardship over generations, <laughs> over years versus the main dynamic of, you know, kind of expro expropriation and, uh, you know, creating of value and, and, and money, um, it's kind of, big part of the dynamic as we go along. I know there's been a struggle in a lot of spaces for indigenous folks to be in like, okay, you want to know how to take care of the land? <laughs> Give us a seat at the table. Like, yeah. you no, know, we know some stuff. It's been passed yeah. down. Like this is, we're here. <laughs> and um, so I, I, I appreciate that because those issues are, are certainly prominent. Um, Okay, before before we wrap up, Jeff, I'm going to do like a little bit of a transport here. I'm going to put you into uh, the philosophy department or the big general conceptual department. There's a question I always ask in this show. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so uh, I'm not sure how far the philosophy department is, but just for you, um, one of the things I ask uh, as the prominent uh, uh, question about everything is, why is there something rather than nothing? Yeah, that's uh, that's the name of the podcast, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll start out, Ken, by saying that um, I mentioned earlier that I'd kind of dabbled in my teens and early 20s, maybe with writing poetry, and it's sort of embarrassing to think about. Um, but I was... Uh, also read a lot of philosophy, and I think I was uh, might have become considered becoming a philosophy major, and um, you know have wound up uh, thinking sort of less about big philosophical questions as, as I've gone along. Um, that said, um, I think you know my contribution to that uh, now fund, I guess that you've developed through your podcast with a bunch of different interesting people responding to that challenging question um, would be, you know, I was kind of wondering about how a Lakota person or an indigenous person might have answered that. Uh, and from what I know, um, and, um, you know, one way of approaching it might be to say, to think about it in terms of um, why human beings have to tell stories uh, rather than not. Uh, that wouldn't explain the universe, but in some ways it would explain a lot about our experience of the universe. And um, I'm struck, I'm always struck by, it's a very simple thing that um, the uh, novelist uh, N. Scott Mamaday said, uh, at one time, um, you know, Mamaday is now in his 80s uh, and was the first Native American to win the Pulitzer Prize for Literature uh, for Housemaid of Dawn. Uh, and he's a Kiowa. And he talks uh, about um, his people, uh, the Kiowas, had come through and lived in the Black Hills for a period of time. Uh, probably in the late 18th century and early 19th. And, you know, Lakota's kind of come in that area a little bit later, and they're there, but don't really gain complete control of it at, at, at first. And so there's a lot of different nations coming through uh, the Black Hills area, and the Kiowas were among them. They want, wind up down in, you know, what becomes Oklahoma. Uh, but Mama Day talks about how when the Kiowas first came into the Black Hills and when they first saw Devil's Tower, which is, you know, this giant monolith, um, seven or eight hundred feet high, he says, and this is the thing that he says, very simple, but I think very profound. He said, when they saw a thing that powerful, they could do nothing else but tell a story about it. They had to somehow. Wow. And I think that tells us something about, you know, who we are and that I don't know why this is, right? But we do. We have to, you know, it's not like they could just say, huh, and go along. They were in the world and the world tell, told them that they had to say something about the world. Yeah. 
And so, um, you know, the Kiowas uh, then made up a story about the creation of this huge, incredibly overwhelmingly powerful thing. Uh, and it was actually, I'm not sure the Kiowa version of the story, uh, but the Lakota version of the story, and they're all fairly similar, so there's a lot of exchange. The Lakota version of the story is that there were um, seven girls who were playing, and they kind of got away from the camp, and a bear started to chase them. And so they ran, and that as they did, the land below them rose up and they were on top of the land, it rose up and uh, the bear kept trying to get them and was clawing at the side of the land as it came up. And if you see Devil's Tower, it has these striations in the and they look like, yeah, I can see that, a bear clawed there. And then they were lifted up and then uh, they were taken uh, by uh, one of their uh, cultural heroes, Fallen Star, rescued them and put them up into the sky, right, as stars. And so that's briefly the story, one of the stories, there are various versions that Lakota's told about that. So Kiowa's story is similar. Um, and Mamaday says, you know, they had to tell that. Yeah. So yeah. That, that's one way uh, maybe to respond. Yeah. No, oh, my gosh. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And um I, I I just pointed to the the particular uh, um, you know land and that it be that you have to talk about it. It's it, yeah. it, it, something has to come out of it, and it has to be a story because it's somehow bigger bigger than what we can figure out. <laughs> yeah, and the story the stories are you know kind of the grounding of 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 creativity, right? You know, and of course, in the Black Hills, they're doing pictographs all the time. You can go and see them. Uh, you know, a lot of the pictographs uh, show lightning. And, you know, of course, we know uh, that all the peoples in recent times where we know something, uh, you know, they all have many, many stories about thunder and lightning. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, so they, you know, again... Yeah. You know, that's, it's all over the place. Yeah. Um, uh, Jeff, um, before we let you go here, um, uh, deep thanks uh, for, for, for sharing your mind, your thinking um, and uh, you know, your flexibility around some pretty big topics in, 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 in stuff that you spent your life, you know, uh, exploring the, the, the final bit, um, you know, for, for the listeners and for you is, is there a way, um, folks uh, like can, can find your work or can in, in, engage with you or what you do academically or otherwise, as far as maybe where to find things, your research, things that you would like to share? Yeah. Well, thanks for, uh, uh, providing that opportunity. Um, uh, you know, my book is is still in print. It, it's uh, been uh, twelve years since it was published, uh, but uh, you know, there's uh, you can get it through all the usual outlets. Um, I for a while I was buying books on Amazon, and I've kind of repented of that. And uh, I've got an arrangement with a local bookseller in Eugene where. Uh, I send him links from Amazon because it's a convenient way to look up books. I send him the links and I say, please order me these five things, you know, and then he does. Uh, so, but however people like to acquire books, that that book is still out there and it's not that expensive in paperback. I, I don't know quite what it is. There's used copies around that probably aren't that expensive. And, um, you know, uh, I also want to recommend a recent book on Lakota history um, that some of your uh, listeners may know of because it's gotten quite a bit of attention uh, from a, a Lakota scholar uh, who's uh, uh, now going to become a professor at the University of Minnesota. He'd been in New Mexico. Uh, his name is Nick Estes, E-S-T-E-S, -E and the book is called Our History is the Future. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's a Lakota history. It's an academic history, 
uh, but it's also deeply informed by his own experiences uh, growing up Lakota and knowing uh, Lakota history as somebody who grew up and, you know, but then studied it uh, in, a, in an academic way as well. Um, that book came out in 2019. Yeah, 2019. And uh, uh, I've assigned it to my students. Uh, it's the kind of book that uh, some of my students have just been blown away by the book. It's, it's, it's the kind of book that could change somebody. Yeah. You know, yeah. you could read a book like that. Like you were saying earlier, uh, before, I guess we started, we were having a little conversation before you started the recording, uh, where you mentioned that, uh, Richard Brennan's work. Yeah. Has been yeah. Uh, and, um, I found his work, uh, quite compelling as well uh, when I came across it and it, uh, many, many years ago as well. Uh, the, uh, uh, our History is the Future is a similar kind of book, I think, that, uh, you know, at, at anyone's age, but I'm thinking particularly my own students' yeah. response to it. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And I love the, you know, the future right in there. I've talked to um, an artist, uh, Steph Littlebird, is very interested in indigenous futurism. And like, yeah. um, there's a uh, science fiction uh, fantasy author, Rebecca Roanhorse, who's, you know, was up for a Hugo Nebula Award of just like, there's something very vital, yeah. very exciting about future oriented um, thinking. And in, in yeah. that, so I, I and that and that's going on there. That that indigenous futures. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just it's it's, it's exciting stuff. Um, uh, Jeff, uh, deep pleasure. I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for for coming on to um to to this show. Um, I am very curious. I love to I love to hear. Um, and I, I feel it's a privilege for me to be able to read, uh, your book. And then be able to talk to you about it in a way where I, I think it's just really helpful for people to hear, understand, interrogate, and times are uh, a changing. And um, so, uh, again, deep thanks for coming on to something rather than nothing. Um, and uh, gosh, on the basis of us talking here, <laughs> I'm not going to assign you as a resident historian, but um, I, I think it would be it'd be nice to to talk again in the, in, in the future, because I, you know, some of these big topics we've, we've broached and um, again, deep thanks, Jeff, uh, for coming out to the program. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Ken. I really enjoyed it. It was really uh, got me thinking about some things I haven't thought about. So I appreciate it very much. Hey, that's uh, for me. I declare that's always a good thing. And I think we might share that. Um, thanks so much, Jeff. And um uh, and, and, and best of luck at the at the UFO, and uh, maybe when I go try to visit my daughter, if I can find time to for that our schedules sync up, uh, I'll try to look for your office. Maybe we could chat yeah, in person yeah. sometime. Let, let, let's have a cup of coffee or something. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Jeff, and uh, best of luck. This is something rather than nothing. 